Self-Publishing Podcast, episode number 68. Welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast, where if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. And now, here are your hosts, three guys who took the red pill and the blue pill, Johnny, Sean, and Dave. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast, the podcast that's all about how to get your words out into the world without contending with agents, publishers, or the other gatekeepers in traditional publishing. I'm Johnny B. Truant, here with Sean Platt and David Wright. And in about 10, 15 minutes, we're going to have Stacy Ennis on, who is an editor and book coach. And she wrote a book called um, The Editor's Eye, because people have been asking so much about editing and working with editors and editing your own stuff that it uh, seemed to make sense to have somebody on. So we'll have her on shortly. Cool. But, uh, That's awesome, because, I mean, I think editing is one of the things that we... I mean, we talk about it a lot. We get asked about it a lot, and it's relevant to 100% of authors, except Johnny. No, that's not true. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're doing the thing Johnny did not want you to do. <laughs> I'm just playing, man. <laughs> well, no, it's because she's not here yet. It's okay. Yeah, just just to be clear, um, I I've been reading everything that Realm and Sands has put out after Sean's gone over it again just because I'm a narcissist, and I'm like, oh, that was awesome. I want to see that awesome thing that I did again. And, you know, Sean was in there somewhere, too, apparently. But I did it. You know, and then so I want to I want to read it again, and then I'm like, I'm noticing things that both of us and the editor missed. So it is, it's, it's different. Like, I edit those things that way is just like kind of like I catch a few typos, which everybody does. Like, you can't get all of those. Uh, and then I actually... Um, I sent CJ a couple. I, she she sent me Snakeskin, one of her books, and I read it. And I sent her a few. I said I noticed a few typos. There were like just like two or three. And she said, "Oh, thank you. It's been through five New York edits." <laughs> right. I, you know what? I'm noticing typos in pretty much everything I read now, because it's just. I mean, they in a in a a real book, right? They're pretty rare, but you still find them. I mean, I I read all of the Collective Inkwell stuff. Um, over again in the last few months, and the most number of um, grammar errors and typos was in Z. Z2134. Published, I mean, professionally published. So Soon to have a sequel. It, oh, we had, more, we had way more errors on our own. We had like a yeah. hundred or something you know, in Yesterday's on, Gone. <laughs> in White Space, we had, we had a lot in White Space. White Space had the most, but we put those through edits since then. Um, so the copies that, that I was reading were, were pretty clean compared to um, like duplicate words and, and, and um, just fatter passages, basically. But I guess that's not the same as a typo. That's it's more of a... Spot. No, and your, your style changes, too. Yeah. Um, was there anything that we wanted to talk about before we have... Stacy on because we don't have any voicemails. I, I was if, just gonna say we don't have any voicemails. If at all. you, there may be nobody loves us. Well, they're, they, Natalie just may not have ripped them off of the the service and put them in my Dropbox yet, or or maybe she even did this morning and I just haven't seen it. So, uh, but I don't have any. So. Well, we're we're a bit behind on them, um, or for me, uh, there's a couple of comments on the site that I'd like to get to. Um, that I just are you had. talking all demure and quiet? Because I thought our levels were right, and you're, he's all like. Oh, well, let me, I'm gonna have it. No, it no. You a little bit later. I, actually, I just um, my, I just had conflict with my daughter a few minutes ago, actually. So, um, I'm just feeling very quiet because when, um, I never escalate with her because it doesn't work. So I, the, like, the louder she gets, the quieter I get. So I'm just like in a real like Zen disciplinary. You're like I right meet now. the monk. You're gonna yeah, go. Yeah. No. And... Totally. <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, oh, we could talk about that. I mean, it's it's small, but we have. I know what I want to talk about real quick. If we have a few minutes, yeah, we got about um, seven minutes. I think I told her one fifteen. Okay, so so this is cool. Um, so this is something that's relevant to um, both Roman Sands and um, Collective Inkwell. Um, I was actually going to suggest you talk about this. Yeah, are, are kind of in a in a transition right now. Um, we've um, so we're we're doing something that Roman Sands is for sure, for sure, for sure doing it. And if Johnny reports to Dave that you know it felt good on the face, he might want to do it too. Um, but uh, but it <laughs> wow, <laughs> try that to class it up for the guests, huh? That joke has gone on so long that it's just now accepted, and I'm imagining somebody coming for the first time to listen to this podcast. Um. So uh, 
Uh, Stacy's yeah. firing her PR person right now. <laughs> like, what did you get me into? So that, um, but we're 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 weaning. We're basically breaking off of the weekly schedule because, and th- that really is a whole show. I think we could do on that because there's so many reasons to and. But in the meantime, we're really um, elevating the importance of the newsletter and making that the weekly experience and making that really special. So one thing that we're going to do for sure is to do a newsletter-only serial. So we're really giving our readers a reason to open that email and hear from us each week, even if we don't have something on Amazon or Kobo to point them towards and that it'll be easier to build and nurture that relationship. So um, what, what, what Johnny and I are doing, today we have Namaste coming out, and um, it's our, um, our monk revenge story. <laughs> um, it's, I, I said on Twitter and Facebook, I said, I said, announcing the most violent thing I've ever written. It is. It is so violent, but, um, but it's poetic, and it's, it's, it's really cool. So... Um, so that violence out, rhymes, and we, we. <laughs> it doesn't really. We sent out a, we sent out our email today telling people that okay, well this is our last like big release, and then for our weekly schedule, and we're we're moving on to something very quickly, um, and we're gonna start um, our serial immediately, and we let the audience decide. Um, I mean, we don't, we just want to write to them. We just want to make them happy, so we don't care what the idea is. Um, we just told them you pick. <laughs> and um, so we're taking the best. We've already got some pretty funny caveman gonna, time cop was one. Oh, that I mean, sounds they're, awesome. They're, they're gonna yeah. they're gonna pitch, and then we're gonna next week we'll have them vote. Yeah, and we're we're submitting we're we're submitting our own, which is dinosaur romance. Um, we said you know give us a one sentence pitch or two words you know put together like caveman time cop. <laughs> and it'll <laughs> which, only be in the serial, so it'll be like installments. Like microfiction each week. Yeah, there'll be like 500 words, and it'll be a lot of fun, I think, to put together and to you know the audience is invested, and that'll we can be really adjust fun. as they go. Like it can be how Hugh Howey was taking live feedback on Wool. Yeah, exactly. I think it's really interactive. It'll it'll be fun as creators. It'll be fun for the readers, and I'm really, really, really excited about it. And um, so anyway, we'll be starting that. Uh, um, I guess the week after next. I mean, we're going fast on that, and um, if Dave wants to find a great idea and he'll do it then. Um, so. the, I, I'm I'm totally sold on both of those things. There were some other components to this which I've now forgotten and um, I, will, I assume we'll discuss as we go and figure it out. But um, there were some components that I wasn't as sure on that, that were like part of the bigger plan. But as far as um, doing a weekly email serial, I'm totally on board with that. I think that'll be awesome. I think it'll increase engagement. And um, the the reason that we're doing the thing with the non when, when Sean says we're breaking from the weekly release schedule, it's not like we're saying we don't want to release every week. Like what that is is it's giving the because we do bend our our schedule and our writing so that we have something every week. So for instance, Unicorn Western we released the full saga. It was the first Realm and Sands release on May twenty second of this year. And we have since released the ones, the individual pieces that hadn't been released, starting with five and then six and then seven, about one a month. And they don't sell at all because if you're, if you get to six or seven and you like the series enough to get to six or seven, you've, re- you've gotten a saga, like, unless you just really want to wait and stretch it out and, because it doesn't save you any money either way and, you know, so, so nobody's buying it and they're just kind of time fillers. But what I think we're training our list to do is to it's like overwhelm. It's like here's something to buy, you know, here's here's something to, to buy again and read again. And you just don't necessarily have that much time. And it's just like sensory overload. And Sean said it's like becoming part of the noise rather than the signal, which is the opposite of what you normally want to do. So we're it's a way of honing focus and saying that rather than deliberately changing this project so that it can be it can give us the right number of weeks. We're just going to do it the way it should be done and release it when it should be done. So, for instance, Namaste was going to be a serial, but it will now be a book with what we've written so far as, as a prologue or a standalone, if that makes sense. Yeah, so basically we're just making sure that we're not writing any less at all, um, but we're no if longer... anything, we're writing more with the thing with Lexi. Yeah, we're not going to be a slave to any specific schedule. 
And um, once we kind of, we, I mean, we have a few months where it's really important to Johnny and I to kind of deliver what we've already promised. Um, so not necessarily in any specific order. And we never had a, a, a release schedule published anyway. So really for the end reader, there's not much of a difference. It's more of an improvement. And for us, you know, we'll get through all the stuff that we kind of had on our docket and, and enter the new year like really, really fresh with some amazing stuff planned. So it's a really, I think, strongly positive change. Um, and I'm excited to see, you know, where it goes. But all elements, uh, the, you know, weaning from the from the weekly to the, the difference in engagement in the, 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 the readers on the list um, to the serial itself. I think it'll all be really, really, really great. Uh, all right. I have invited Stacy, so um, hopefully she'll she'll uh, join us. And if, if we if we don't, then I have contingency plans in place. <laughs> um, this is so so. This is uh, I, I just I just public service announcement here. Garrett Robinson says, "May I just say, don't know if it's on topic. <laughs> Namaste kicks fucking ass." So they just because the people need to know these things. So no, I'm really really pleased with Namaste. Namaste made me really happy. I will say I read I read um, I read Namaste out loud to Cindy, and she asked me to please stop. Um, <laughs> it, it was she's like I the, thought okay. that was the beam. Um, the beam no, torture scenes. No, it was it was that. It was it's been a it's been a few things we've done together. Actually, <laughs> she probably got lured with Unicorn Western into thinking that I was also. She was like, "Oh, thank God, he's not going to write <laughs> yeah, this terrible." Yeah, the Orion stuff, stuff not so much. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, but uh, r real quick on the on. Um, I mean, this is kind of relevant to our our guest today. But another another really cool benefit of writing the little um this 500 word snippet serials in our um, in our newsletter is they don't have to be perfect like that's a looser environment um, just having 500 words um, in an email means that you can tell your story kind of faster and get it all out let the audience participate in it and then when it's all done like maybe a year from now who knows how long it'll take to tell whatever story we're going to tell um, putting that together will be will be a lot of fun it'll be really really cool I'm, Looking forward to that. Why does Dave keep disappearing? <laughs> I don't know. I think that he's he's finally reached the point where he doesn't he's not going to take any more of our shit. Like I think that's what it is. <laughs> the um the best was on the last we, we recorded, by the way, if anybody's anticipating better off undead, first of all, what's wrong with you? But second, um <laughs> I hate to disappoint you, but we recorded that yesterday. Uh was it yesterday? It, it was, was two yesterday. days ago. Yeah. Yesterday. That was yesterday. Because uh Sean's uh oldest friend uh, Jimmy, or Jim, as he's known to everybody but Sean, who's a cop. no. It's see, I just it's it's Uncle Jimmy. That's why my my kids call him. He's Uncle Jimmy, and you can't have an Uncle Jim. It's Uncle Jimmy. Like as soon as we put the uncle there, and then I just figure I have to call him Uncle too. And then I can get okay, wait, 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 wait to wait to rationalize. So <laughs> anyway, so he was on Uncle Jimmy, which sounds like he's making sausage, and uh, he 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 nailed it. He said, "Do you guys just make fun of?" Dave the whole time like is that what this is and I was like yeah that that's what it is like that should be the tagline it should be better off undead the podcast where we just rail on Dave the shitting whole time. on Dave 50 episodes in a row <laughs> yeah so um I don't know. I just thought that was interesting, but but yeah, he's he's gone. He's I got his avatar. Yeah, he's, he's been gone for like two thirds of the episode. He just keeps disappearing. So we'll see if he comes on. We're, I'm also uh, watching my email slash. Uh, whatever for to just see when Stacy's gonna pop in. Um, well, whatever. So we'll figure that out. So but what's our meantime, contingency if not? Oh please! Like we're gonna have any trouble. <laughs> the the idea is like if we needed a contingency. First of all, she emailed me this morning, so she's not. It, it'll just be our fuck up. Like it won't yeah. be that she isn't able to make it. Um, so we don't need a contingency. Contingency. We just need something to talk about that when she jumps in, you know, we'll we'll be able to transition. So. Maybe we could talk about our... By the way, her book, The Editor's Eye, if you go to selfpublishingpodcast.com slash edit, I just made a, a short link to her book. And um, she talks about right, working with editors, but a lot of it is is just like self-editing too. Like what's the process of editing look like? Not necessarily just how do you find an editor and work with an editor. And so it made me think like, okay, so this is stuff that we all do. And I take it for granted, but I imagine that our editing processes are different. So maybe we could start by talking about that. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. 
Um, because it is, it is, it is all different. And I think that what your expectations mm -hmm. are um, for an editor, or it's a personal thing too. I mean, the best editors aren't necessarily, you know, just correcting grammar and typos. They're understanding you and what you're trying to say so that you can say it better than you're saying it. And, um, you know, because an editor isn't necessarily, I mean, they are changing your words, but they should mm -hmm. never change your message. They're just bringing out your message in a way that makes it so super clear for the reader in a way that you didn't. I am pausing the uh, audio because she says she's logged in but not sure what to do from here. Um, so YouTube, as usual, gets bonus content. Uh, but I don't even know how to reply to this. It's like a Google Plus thing, and I don't... And there's no, like, reply button or anything. What the hell oh, do I do? For you YouTube-only people, check it out. Bam! I may be getting that today. Uh, oh, and I, I, just, um, I just realized that Garrett asked me to mail him a picture yesterday, and I didn't. Sorry, Garrett. <laughs> How, this is like the thanks Google. The, this is like the least useful thing ever. It just, it's just her her comment, but there's no. I don't know what to do with it. Like, do I click on it? Do I? There's nothing. No buttons or anything. I can delete Hangout history. That's what I can do. That that sounds productive. Can, can any of us see it? I don't know. It says uh, Hangout with Stacy Ennis. So that's not uh, correct. Our Hangout is self-publishing podcast. So I'm not sure what this Hangout is. Uh, all right. I love the YouTube videos. I just I wonder when people just encounter the YouTube videos and uh, don't know what to do with them. So <laughs> uh, worst comes to worst, I can always just call her on the phone. But let me see if I can uh, do this. You guys can just talk about something. Talk about Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Jimmy. I don't know if you Dave you if you heard that he's justified it as being Uncle Jimmy. No, I think he was he was MIA at that point. Yeah, he's Uncle Jimmy. So Jimmy Jimmy goes with Uncle Uncle Jimmy. That's that's fine. Are you uh, calling him Uncle Jimmy? Yeah, <laughs> which is really <laughs> creepy. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I seriously I I have tried. This is okay. Here's here's a funny Uncle Jimmy story. <laughs> so I came to visit him after um uh, this is freshman year of college. He went to UCSB. And I drove up one weekend, or I guess it would be down. No, it was up. I drove up to see him one weekend. And um, this was after he'd been there maybe like two months. And he had already established himself as Jim <laughs> like for the entire floor. I wasn't even thinking. I'm like, hey, Jimmy. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so um, it ended up after I left that weekend, there were a few key people who just started calling him Jimmy forever. One of those people... Um, who had already been completely trained to call him Jim, has gone on to call him Jimmy for the last 15 years. <laughs> and they've <laughs> this has been, and then he introduces him as Jimmy. He's like, yeah, dude, it's got a ripple effect. You gotta stop. It's pretty funny. So, uh, a, um, a, like a, a URL for a Hangout? Like, can I send her to the Hangout? I don't know. Maybe. Try. Uh, Okay, okay, that's what I'm asking. There. Like, how do I? So I would probably do it before. Um, well, no, just give her the whole thing. The, the what's what's in the plus.google.com. It's it's not. No, it's. Oh, I see. Can I do that? I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if. I can do that. Hmm. These YouTube videos have to be fascinating. <laughs> you just skip ahead, folks. Skip ahead. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Um, I'll, I'll try. I'll invite her again too. We should probably do um, like tests. You know what I mean? Before, yeah. Before we have somebody on, actually, like get in a hangout with them if they aren't 100 percent sure. Uh, okay, so I did invite her again. I would think the the invite's supposed to pop up. That's what happens for me. I tell wish I could to, pause the video. Tell her to go to plus.google.com. Her PR person said she's worked Google Hangouts before, so. Uh, I did. I did tell her to go to plus.google.com. I really wish I could pause YouTube. I can end Start it, over. but then I'd have to. But then, yeah, but then it's two videos. Sorry, tubers. Yeah, we sorry, can delete guys. it. <laughs> delete the first one. <laughs> delete but then we have nothing. 
You know what we could do? We could once the um once the uh would we be able to do this once the video ends? Go to the the point where it starts and gets you know not. No, stupid you again can only trim the ends. It's the no, I don't oh, mean trim it, out. but just leave a note like it starts again at this point. So you can put you can yeah, put a note. You, yeah, there you go. Go ahead, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it. Awesome. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is um. I'm going I'm I'm sending her an email and uh it, I'm just going to call her on Skype and we'll just do audio. It's just easier that way. So right. we'll we'll we can uh talk about our editing processes for a few minutes after I send this email and I'll resume it. So Okay. Uh all right. So I have sent that email all right, so while we're waiting for our, our guest, um, I've resumed here, and uh, what were we, I think you were going to answer, Sean, about... I, you, I don't know, you were talking about editing. I don't know that you actually began to answer something. Of course, there was no question, so that probably... Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. That was like, in case, I mean, <laughs> if you're listening to... Oh, well, to now, how are you possibly going to get going, then? I mean... <laughs> Starting from fresh on a conversation. I don't know that I can. If you if you're just listening to the audio, we've been um, paused for 94 minutes <laughs> trying to. Um, on I, better off on dead yesterday, we asked Jim. We said, so is a percentage of total words said during your friendship? How many have been yours? And he he agreed that it was a 90-10 relationship in Sean's favor. Sean oh, and I, I think he may have been generous of that. Jim, Jim's a real quiet guy. <laughs> but when he talks, it's always the right stuff. Um, We're probably going to get that guy uh, calling us back, and he's going to say, you have Jim on, and then you don't let him talk. <laughs> I wanted to hear from Jim. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, editing. Um, from a, that local editing team. Yeah. <laughs> They're fantastic. No typos on there. Watch. <laughs> Sean, what's your process look work look like? Because so much of the Realm and Sand stuff, I don't even see again. So basically, I I do I don't even call it an edit. I call it a polish, because it's just last last stuff, just trying to smooth stuff out and catch typos and make sure I like the phrasing and stuff. In I do, I do that on the Unicorn series, Beam, and so far I think that's it. Right, everything else has been has gone. Me, the you, editor. editor, done. Yeah. Um, well, it depends. It depends on the project that I'm I'm working on. Pretty much everything. Well, no. I mean, I guess I have a few patterns, um, but it just depends. I think most times um, I actually just start um, editing. Um, sometimes I read what I'm going to edit first, um, but often I don't. And I think it just depends. It depends on the. It depends on how well I know the story. I guess if I kind of know what's going to happen. Um, but if I'm editing something really cold, like some of the um, some of the guy incognito stuff that I did with Rachel, um, I had to read those first because I didn't really I, I didn't she made up the story, so I didn't know what was going to happen. But if we're in like um, if it's something that you don't read them through entirely first, you do no, edit as you go. No, I I, I edit because right, I, I leave you notes thinking that you do you look at the Scrivener notes oh, first at least? Yeah, no, no, I always look at notes first. Okay, actually, that's a good point. So so. What I do, I, I rarely sit and read the whole document because I don't really want to speed read it. And if I sit and actually read it, then like that's a big chunk of time that's just there. Um, so what I do, the first thing is just kind of look over the whole document. Um, if there's any notes that are left for me, you know, I click on those notes, see where they are on the copy, and kind of get a, a like a bird's eye view. Um, it's a little bit like um, oh, she's never. Joining us. It, it's a little bit Yay, like never. Yay! I was just firing hey. up Skype. Um, so our guest today is, and I'll bet you're muted, Stacy, because there's four of us. So if the big uh, mute microphone in the upper right is red, you need to click on it to unmute yourself. Uh, but our guest is Stacy Ennis. Yeah. There you go, yay! Book <laughs> editor and author of uh, <laughs> The Editor's Eye, which I mentioned is at selfpublishingpodcast.com slash edit if you want to check it out. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So... Maybe it's best to start with like a big picture question of like when do you can you give us an overview of of like when it makes sense to sort of process your own material and hire an editor and I'm just looking for like the big picture <laughs> editing I don't know that's like the worst question ever maybe Dave should step <laughs> in. 
Are you just you're just kind of looking for an overview of the editing process? Well, so many of our of our listeners uh, ask questions about editing, and it, it it runs the gamut from sort of the process of editing your own work uh, and just like giving it subsequent polishes, and then maybe you send it to an editor, and maybe you don't for like a a, a final check and developmental developmental edit and you know some people don't and some people send to beta readers and so I just wanted to get like the, the spectrum I guess. Sure well you know a lot of that's dictated by budget just being realistic some people have more money to spend on editing than others so in an ideal world your book would go through four stages of editing um, and you'd, you'd probably have at least five different editors three of those being proofreaders. Um, but, you know, budgets, again, budgets kind of dictate whether or not that happens and, and how many stages your book can go through. Um, I really recommend that, that most people hire an editor when they actually begin working on their book. And this is especially true for new authors who aren't familiar with outlining, who aren't familiar with determining their audience and really refining their message. Um, and obviously fiction and nonfiction are a little different, but you can hire an editor to help you get started and really plan your book out, whatever that means for you. Some people like to plan their book out, you know, to the last sentence and other people like to have more of a broad kind of general roadmap. Um, and then, you know, so there's a developmental stage and then there's the substantive or content editing stage. And that's more, that takes place usually after the first draft of your book is written and that's where your, your editor will come in and and offer big picture changes or major suggestions. Uh, they might suggest cutting an entire chapter, or rewriting a few pages. That can be the most painful part for a lot of people. Um, and then after that, it's mostly the refining. So copy editing would be stage three, and that's really just refining your work at the sentence level. And then I I really recommend that books go through three stages of proofreading. But you know, again, that kind of depends on budget. So. So what made what made you write uh, the editor's eye? Well, I did. Uh, has it been two years or three years ago? I think it was two years ago. I did a workshop at a regional publishing event here in Idaho, and I I really didn't expect that many people to come to my workshop. Partially because there were three other really amazing people doing workshops at the same time. It was the first event of the day uh, for the entire workshop or the entire weekend. I thought people would sleep in and miss it. And I actually ended up with this huge room of authors all just eagerly sitting there listening intently to every word I had to say. And then the entire two days of the conference, they were literally lining up to talk to me to ask questions about editing. And I realized there is a huge need for education around editing. People really want to know about it. And that's, that's just what inspired me to write the book. And what's your background? Well, I have, um, I have a degree in, in writing, and I am this close to completing my master's in professional writing and editing. I took a little hiatus to take a, a big contract here as the executive editor of the Sam's Club magazine uh, about a year ago. Um, and so, yeah, I've worked, I've done a lot of books. I don't even know how many, but very many. And in all genres, from young adult to business books, I, I just finished ghostwriting a book. Um, I've, I've finished three books this year ghostwriting to and writing my own. Um, so it's kind of a wide range. I do a lot of ghostwriting for magazines, a lot of article writing, blogs, that sort of thing. So what, what, what are some of the most common uh, flaws that you see in people, in both people that come to you for editing and maybe people that don't think they need editing? What, what are some of the signs that, oh, this, this person really needs someone? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's interesting that, that you mentioned people that don't think they need editing because although I think a lot of people kind of have big egos. It's I find that a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's so true. And I, I get so many people that write me emails and they say, well, you know, I think my book's really good, so I really just need somebody to proofread it. That's the most common, the most common email I get. But I find that actually a lot of people really really do need help with their books and there's you know it's just so hard to look objectively at your work without an outside perspective um, but anyway that made, that made me laugh because that's pretty common <laughs> what when people hire an 
I'm, I'm deflecting a little bit. <laughs> the, um, but one of the questions we get we get a lot, and I mean, I think we all have have opinions on this in terms of working with an editor, because when Sean and I work collaboratively, we have editors that we work with, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's it seems like it's undervalued. The, the idea of the editor doesn't just need to understand the rules of grammar, but needs to understand sort of what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. and what your your voice is, and what your style is. How much have you found that to be true? Oh, it's. I mean, I think that's more important than skill in a lot of ways. I mean, skill is obviously very important, but you. <clears throat> excuse me. Your your editor has to be. You guys have to be partners, and they really need to understand what you're doing. An editor that just comes in and is a grammar Nazi isn't going to help your book. They really need to understand your subject, and if they haven't learned about your subject before, they need to be able to put themselves in the place of a reader and you know be a reader advocate that can give you good feedback. But yeah, that relationship I feel like is the most important. I love that answer. That answer is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, what, one of the hardest things for new authors is that most of them can't really afford editing. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the very, very, you know, minimal? Uh, what, what's the least someone could do without embarrassing themselves? And then, what's the next step? And how do you find an editor? And I have one more question to lump onto that before you answer it. Sure. And it's sort of, <laughs> sort of, if you if you can't if you don't have a big budget, and in terms of what Dave was saying then a lot of times the only editor you can get is somebody who will fix typos and stuff like that, and it's just one degree removed from proofreading, so how do you, how do you bridge that? So if I know that's can't. a lot of questions. <laughs> no, I'm trying to jot them down so I can remember. Answer all. We're going to give you 20 <laughs> right in a row. <laughs> I'm going to test your memory. Okay, so bare bones. Um, bare bones basic editing. That's a really hard question for me to answer. I feel like it's... It's kind of the answer a wedding photographer usually gives when they're trying to explain how much they charge for for pictures. It's editing. I feel like editing is the most important stage your book goes through, and it is expensive. It can be very expensive. If you don't have the budget, um, there's you know there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of help your book <laughs> if you can't afford to have a professional editor do a really thorough job on it. One of those is is eliciting reader feedback. You know, having beta readers. But one thing that I find people do wrong in that stage is they tend to send out their books without really any direction for their beta readers. So they'll send out their book, it's however many words, maybe 80,000 words, and they'll say something along the lines of, hey, here's my book, um, can you just be honest and give me your feedback? And for a beta reader, that's very overwhelming. They have no idea how to provide feedback. You know, they, they probably haven't done it before. So I actually, on my website, provide a uh, reader feedback form that authors can can download and actually send out with their book. So that can be really helpful. And, and if you can't what, afford somebody to do that, that can be a great... What's, what's the URL for your website? Um, it's stacyennis.com, S-T-A-C-Y-E-N-N-I-S.com. Yeah, so there's a PDF you can download. And that I've found that to be incredibly helpful to authors, just planning that and offering them a way to actually give feedback. Yeah, that, um, that takes something and, and greatly amplifies its value. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about, many of us have been on the other side of that, and oftentimes it's a friend. So, you know, there's kind of a line between, okay, I want to give good feedback, but I don't want to lose my friend. But if they actually give you specific questions, it can be really helpful. And... and uh, the second question was, yeah. how, do you, how do you go about finding it? Or a lot of people, that, that's like one of the biggest questions we get. We really don't know what to tell people because for us, uh, we've kind of developed relationships with people, but it's not like something I can prescribe to people. Hey, well, just, you know, go find an editor you used to work with and hire them. <laughs> so yeah. how, how do people that don't know anything about editors or editing, how do they find, is there like a central depository where editors are held and stored overnight and waiting to write? <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I always feel like the best, the number one place is referral. So if you know an author who has published before, ask them about their editor, but ask questions. So, you know, were you happy with their work? Did they provide it on time? Did they stay within the budget they told you? Did you feel like they improved your work? What didn't you like about them? So asking good questions to them is important. If you can't find one that way, you can, um, 
you can call your local or regional publishing houses and ask if they have recommendations. I would just make sure that they publish in your genre. So you obviously wouldn't want to, want to call a publishing house that publishes business books if you're writing a vampire novel. Um, <laughs> that actually and, gives me a good idea. <laughs> another option, and I'm sticking kind of, I'm starting local because a lot of people like to work local or you know at least somebody in their time zone. Um, you can also go to local bookstores and they usually have shelves with local authors so you can go to similar books, flip to the acknowledgement section, they usually list the editors in there so you can find them that way. If that, if that doesn't work out, you can try online sources like the Editorial Freelancers Association, I think it's just the hyphen efa.org. Um, I can send you guys the actual, a few websites after this by email okay. too. We'll put it all in the show notes for mm -hmm. listeners. Um, and I, there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there's also the Editorial, Editorial Freelancers Association of Canada, which they have more stringent guidelines than, than the EFA. Um, and then, also, yeah, I'll send you guys a few more that you could post on your site, too. Um, we'll just put those a, in the show notes. Just a cautionary what not to do. Uh, if, if you're using a site like Elance, um, you, you really want to be, this is a, this, I mean, uh, she was talking about working locally, and the opposite of that is, you know, you can get very cheap work done overseas, but it's not like someone building you a website or something where, where maybe language doesn't matter as much. <laughs> if you're writing a book and you have somebody who that's not their native tongue editing it so you can save money, it's just a, it's a juggernaut of a bad decision because mm -hmm. you really want you want to have the same. Can't believe people language. do that. Yeah. So, it, well, wow. it, it, because you you want to be careful too. I mean, if you if you put your stuff up on Elance, you can you can say whatever you want. You can pitch. It's really just paying attention and seeing that. Oh well, you know, because you can have somebody, for example, in in Mumbai. Right, and they're they're living there, and they're outsourcing, and they're not charging very much for their editing, and they can actually put a really good pitch together, and they're they're very educated. So it's not like you're hiring somebody who's not educated, but that doesn't mean they know the nuances of our culture and what it's like to live here, and that's really important if your if your ideal reader is somebody who, you know, is, is somebody like you in in that local way, and you that's something you actually have to look for. Like you may not realize that you're hiring someone overseas, you just think you're hiring somebody who's not charging very much. But look for where they're coming from because that does make a difference in an editor. So Stacy, uh, what, what should a new author plan to spend uh, if they're gonna get their book? What, what should they uh, budget for? Uh, because we have somebody in our comments here, Chrissy Moss, uh, wrote that she spent $400 for uh, an edit and it wasn't even that great. Personally, I, I, I don't know how long that work was, but $400 doesn't seem like a lot, even though it is for most people that are just starting out. $400 is a lot of money, but yeah. having spent a lot more than that, we, we know it can get but a little see, bit But see, that's higher. the problem with this, is that there's it's so expensive to get good work right at a time when you know, a starting out writer doesn't have that. Like that, that, that gap between what is needed and what is affordable is massive for most authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the conundrum of life, right? I mean, <laughs> it's it's just it, it is expensive, and I don't really honestly think there's much of a substitute for a great editor. You can do your best through friends who and people in your intended reader, you know that are your intended readers that can give you feedback, but it's not something that you can, like you said, you can't outsource it. If you pay a really low fee, you're likely to get poor work. Um, $400 is not a lot of money to spend for editing a manuscript, unless it's like a two-page manuscript. It's, it is expensive. You'd ask about how much people can expect to pay. Um, that's a really hard question to answer because manuscripts range from 20,000 words to you know 200,000 words, so it, it will really depend. How about per 10,000 words? Um, well, is there like been, a standard baseline or no? Uh, well, kind of. So, so in my book, I I have a little short section on you know what you can expect to pay, but what you'll find in it is actually that they're kind of all over the place, and so 
you know, some editors charge by the page, some charge by the hour, some ch charge by X amount of words. Developmental editing is way more expensive than proofreading. Um, so I can kind of give you maybe an hourly range and, and maybe about how many hours it might take to work on something. Um, so let's let's go with a, a 40,000 word manuscript because that's a general nonfiction kind of range. So we'll, we'll go with that. So let's say that you, you want to hire somebody as a content editor. So that means that your book's finished and you just want a really thorough read of your manuscript. So they're not actually revising much at the sentence level. They might be doing a little bit, but they're more kind of reading it and giving feedback to help you revise it so that you can send it to copy editing. I would say that, you know, you can usually find somebody in the, a really good editor in the 50, 50, 60 dollar an hour range. You can often find editors in the 30 to 40 dollar an hour range, but they, they won't be as experienced. You can sometimes find them less expensive, but you're risking hiring somebody that maybe has never really worked on books before. Um, to do that kind of editing for that length of book would probably take me in the 20 to 25 hour range to complete. So I don't have a calculator handy, but that can kind of give you an idea of, of about how much it would end up costing. Like is, that is, that, is that development or <laughs> developmental or is that like proofreading editing? That would be that would be content editing, which is the, the second stage. So it's the kind of step down from planning. So you've actually written your manuscript and you're getting the first really thorough read and feedback of your book. Um, Proofreading is usually less expensive because it's less of a skill than than something like a content read and content feedback is. So, you know, many proofreaders will charge in the range of thirty to fifty dollars an hour. Just it just really depends also on your market. So, I live in Boise, Idaho. People tend to charge on the lower end here. If you're in New York, you're probably going to be charging or spending quite a bit more than you know someone here, unless you hire somebody you know, in Boise or something like that. <laughs> yeah, Cr uh, Chrissy said that her manuscript was 30,000 words. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the way that, uh, the issue that I have sometimes with, with editing um, boils down to I don't mind spending money on something if, I'm, if it's going to be worth it. Sure. And it seems like so many times, like he here's, who, here's who I trust as, I know I trust as editors. Sean... Dave, because we think alike, and they're they're writers, and I think that um, a lot of times people don't. I don't know if they're not doing due diligence, or there's just a lot of people that people end up with it. It, it it's just they aren't like when when I hand Sean a manuscript and he does his thing and he hands it back and I read it again. It, it's better in a way that's hard for me to even quantify. Like it's mm -hmm. just it's just better. It's smoother. He adds little details. Um, you know, he just—it's just—it's different from what I think a lot of people's editing experiences have been, and I think if you send in a, a manuscript off and you pay a bunch of money, and really it's like, well, you know, I—it's just—it's not—it's not right in a way that again I can't really say. I, well, I, I guess that just comes down to experience. In all fairness, Johnny, I, I don't know how many editors you've actually hired for your fiction stuff. So it, it's probably just a matter of finding the right person if you did mm -hmm. want to find an editor. And that's, uh, that, I, that's that same question again. In Johnny's defense, though, I will say of his book, he and his wife and Sean, they, they all kind of handle them together. Uh, Sean and I hire an outside editor because I make far more mistakes than Johnny. <laughs> but I will say of Johnny's books, they're remarkably error-free, more than a lot of books I see. So... I, I think Johnny's just very OCD, and he's able to drill down and disconnect himself in a way that most people can't. I know I couldn't. I could not write a book without an editor. Uh, it, yeah. It's just a fact. But, but they, you need to think of an editor as a collaborator, and I think that if if I feel like I'm working with an editor who does feel like a collaborator, then I think it would be different. But mm -hmm. I have the bad taste in my mouth from... So, so Stacy, you mentioned the idea of giving your, your beta readers, uh, give me your feedback. And that's, that's that hangover from, like, high school literature class or writing class where you have a writing circle and everybody mm -hmm. passes something around and everybody feels they have to say something. So yeah. they say something just to say it, and you're like, no, no, that's stupid. Stop. <laughs> so I think that's, that's part of it, too. But you're, Dave's right. I haven't worked with a lot of professional editors except through Sean on the stuff we worked for on together. 
Yeah, well, and I think a lot of that is also just doing your homework. I find that a lot of authors, I mean, finding an editor can be really hard. So, you know, when you do finally find an editor who isn't booked out for three months and they're available to take your manuscript, you want to jump on it. But I think that authors need to slow down. They need to have an extended conversation with the editor they're about to hire. They need to ask them a lot of questions. You're putting a substantial amount of money into a project. And this is somebody that can really make or break your book in a lot of ways. So you shouldn't be afraid to interview them. I mean, ask them questions. I suggest working on a sample chapter with them before you put down a full deposit for your manuscript. Uh, I mean, they'll charge you for it most of, the time, most of the time, but at least you have the chance to work on 10 pages instead of 200 and see if you like them. Um, but, I mean, I find that people spend, honestly, more time looking for a good job interview outfit than they do interviewing an editor and making a decision, you know. So, so I think doing your homework is really the most important way that you can avoid, have, you know, getting that bad taste in your mouth if you don't have it, or if you've been through that, just making sure that doesn't happen again. Do you know anything or have any opinions on the, um, the editing that CreateSpace offers? You know, I've, I have really no experience with them as far as the quality. I, I, I like local or, you know, at least knowing who you're working with and having a good relationship with them and really getting to know them and them being available. So if it were me, I, I would probably choose to seek out my own editor and, you know, work closely with them in a different way. Um. I was had something that I was going to say, and I totally, I totally forgot. <laughs> um, well, how many? I mean, in your experience, the okay. So, so I'm just I'm dealing with the same old issue, right? So, sure. when when I when I started working with Sean, it doesn't bother me when he edits my stuff because we're collaborators, we're partners. And have you ever run into any editors who are I, this may be totally off the wall. Like, is there? Do any of them work sort of as, as like a, almost a contingency sort of a basis? Like, we're in this together, and um, I'm guessing no, because like why for would a you split not want of to royalties or something? I, I'm guessing the answer is. I guess I can answer my own question because most people don't make money. <laughs> well, um, I mean, people try. I get I get a lot of emails. I mean, I get several emails every week for people who are looking for editors, and often I get emails from authors who would like me to work for free to edit their manuscript for a royalty split. And I, I really empathize with them. I know that it's hard and I know that you know you want the best editing and you can't always afford it, but the, probably the only time that that will happen is somebody who doesn't you know have a lot of experience and they're just trying to get a few books under their belt. Um, you know I mean I work as a collaborator with people but I'm getting paid for it. So you know I'm they hire me as a co-writer or they'll hire me as you know, an editor, but more of more of a ghostwriter, um, and that sort of thing. I'd never do it. I, I, I'm answering my own question. I'd never do that. <laughs> no, but no. It, the idea of having so, of somebody having skin in the game is is in, is enticing, but I, I I would never do that. They I they guess. do ha they do have skin in the game though. Even even if you're paying them, they have skin in the game because their name is on it as one of the editors, and mm -hmm. they want your book to do well because you'll hire them again, especially if it does well. So I think an editor does have a lot of skin in the game in this case. This is where I'm cynical, Dave. So you're usually the cynic. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually with Johnny on this one. <laughs> I want to be optimistic, but I I think most people when it's Yes, they have skin in the game, but paid work is different than partnered work. It just is. It 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 is. But there's no way to solve. Well, that. that's why that's why Stacey's saying you take your time and you find the right person. Mm -hmm. And I I don't think you can shortchange that. I mean, really, you think of all the editors we've used until we found Jason. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to disparage their work. I mean, they've done varying jobs of good or greatness or whatever, but. You know, Jason is right for you know what you and I are doing. So everybody need ev totally agree. Everybody needs to find that person. Stacy, would you expect a lot of false starts then? Because, um, I mean, I would think that maybe people are overly like I'm going to nail the perfect editor match right away, and maybe it's the sort of thing you look on a career perspective rather than like right here, right now. I'm going to get perfect. Is that true at all? You mean um, you start working with somebody and it doesn't work out? 
Yeah, I have an I idea. Maybe writers should like use editors they're not sure about and use a pen name with those people <laughs> until they find the right one. Then they say, okay, I can now put my real name on this and I found the right person. <laughs> that almost well, sounds like a joke answer. No, no, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have seen some bad matches, but it doesn't happen that often if you, if you spend the time to make sure it's the right person. Like I said, working with... Working on a sample chapter or a short, short section of your book, or even if you like to write short stories, if you work on something like that, if you're a nonfiction author, have them edit a blog post. You know, do some small things with them beforehand and make sure they're a good fit. Um, make make sure also that they're willing to explain their edits to you or talk to you about it. That um, that they're more of a suggestive editor rather than kind of a drill sergeant. So, you know, as an editor, I know that I make. Edits and and as an author, you may or may not accept them, and that's that's your prerogative because it's your book. But you know you have to make sure that that the editor you select has that kind of attitude, and they and they really respect you, and they care about you. They're an advocate for you. They want you to be successful. Um, you know they're really a partner. Okay, I want I, we we have a lot of different listeners on this show, and I'm sure there's some startup and tech people out there. I just want to say anybody out there that wants to start like an eHarmony site for editors and writers, matching them up, uh, do it. Yeah. <laughs> you will be very successful. That's thumbs a really up, good thumbs idea, down, actually. That actually Stacey, totally the great. idea is yours. <laughs> I like that. Do That's it. Great. Do it. We, we would try it if we had the time because we we know a lot of people and we could probably do it, but it, we just could not. No, we, we we write too much, so it's impossible for us. But anybody else out there, please do the idea, and and then come on our show, and we'll support you, and blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea, actually. And e so, harmony for writers. And Daisy, who who is your book for, and who's it really going to help, and what's it going to help them do? And did you well, edit it yourself? Oh no, I no, did she not did edit it. it. I no, no, I did not edit. I mean, obviously, I revised it, but. I had a really awesome editor, Genevieve de Guzman, and she she was great. I think we went, I, I can't remember how many drafts we went through, but I think it was somewhere around nine, and those were full, full-on revisions, and it took us a year and a half to oh, finish wow. it. Um, the, who is it for? It's for authors in general. I think it will most benefit new authors who have no idea what they're doing, but some self-published authors especially who put books out but don't feel like they've been doing it quite as effectively as they could or just want to understand more about the editing process. There's, some, uh, there's a section on publishing too, so they can learn about that. Um, and then also kind of a, an additional audience that I've learned about is people interested in book editing. So, you know, maybe some, some college graduates or adults who are wanting to switch their careers into book editing. I found that's actually been a really good introduction for them, which I didn't intend, but it's yeah, it's been nice that it reaches another audience. Now, w will it help the the poor author out there that has no money to really hire an editor? Will it help them at all? Like maybe guide them towards kind of shoving something together that'll almost do. And I'll I want to lump that together with the question I was going to ask, which is how much can people how much can people do on their own, and is there a different way that they can sort of get outside as much as possible and and learn what an editor does. I mean, you talk about the editor's eye, so I'm sort of... Sure, yeah. So, so yes, I think it can help somebody without a budget. And the reason I say that is because the book actually offers an entire, entirely new approach to the writing process through an editor's point of view. And so my whole... My whole reason for writing that is because, you know, I was actually an English teacher for a little while, and um, I taught overseas in the Dominican Republic. I ran a high school English program, and I learned a lot about how people write and and kind of was discouraged by the fact that our, our system really, and we were teaching American curriculum over there, so, you know, our system kind of teaches this cyclical writing process where, you know, you you research and brainstorm, and then you write an outline, and then you write your draft, and then you revise it, and then it's done. Um, so my book actually offers an entirely new approach to that that helps people discover their own writing process and, and what works for them, and also offers self-editing techniques and teaches them how to best approach their book. For example, you know, letting it sit for two to six weeks after your first draft so that you can kind of detach from it and come back and 
edit it with a fresh mind. Those are the kind of tips that you'll find in there. So if you don't have a budget, sure, yes, you can absolutely still get something out of it. I don't know if I answered both of your questions fully. So. Yeah, you did. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, and he, I just I just want to derail this with this comment from Nicholas, who says this whole episode is just a way for guys to passively aggressively fire Garrett. <laughs> Garrett is one of the guys who works with us. So uh, anyway. That's um, funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what else? What else we got? Any 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 final questions for Stacy? Uh, outlining. What, what what tips can you give us on outlining? That, and maybe that's, uh, with that, an eye toward editing down the road, like the pre-editing. Well, yeah, th th this is a, a we've kind of battled back and forth on this. Uh, we're kind of in between uh, pantsing and outlining, and I think we've gradually moved more towards outlining and writing out story beats and I stuff. I think it's really harmonized. I'd say it's really, really a nice blend. So, so, so what, what are your thoughts on outlining, and how do you see it worked differently with different people? Well, so it's kind of the same idea with the writing process. I, I feel like everybody has their own unique outlining process, too. And I actually, I had kind of an epiphany on this when I was actually in art school. So I have a minor in visual art, and I was working on this sculpture, and I had a really hard time coming up with a, an idea. I was just completely stumped. I'd been sketching forever. And my art teacher said to me, well, aren't you a writer? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you write and, and come up with your ideas that way and then sketch it out? And so I kind of realized that, you know, I was prescribing to this notion of an artist being this particular kind of person that plans it a certain way and does it this way. And so I started realizing that, you know, we're all kind of taught a very um, – typical outlining process and that everyone has a different way that they actually can outline their book and and I feel like everyone can benefit from outlining you just have to find the right way to do it I also feel like a lot of people start their books and never finish them or they finish it 20 30 years later planning out your book I think is the most important thing you can do to ensure that you actually finish it um, do a good job on it and actually get it published. I mean, it not only does it help you set up a roadmap for how you'll go about writing your book, but it's also kind of motivating. You start seeing yourself tackling little goals along the way. You know you've planned out this chapter and now it's done and you're moving on to this chapter and now it's done. Um, and then the other thing is, as writers, we tend to have all these crazy, weird things floating around in our heads all the time. and Having a place to plug those those crazy weird things is really great because if you have an outline already put together, you can say, okay, I just I just had this awesome idea come up. Where can I put this? Oh, I can put it here. Instead of just jotting it on a piece of paper or putting it in a file on your computer and completely forgetting about it. So yeah, I think it's it's critical. It's um, and it's a really important tool for authors to learn how to do. So, so what what are some of the uh, outlining tools you use? Do you use like any tech things? Uh, like we we use Scrivener and I forget the name. Yeah, the, the actual <laughs> the actual uh, mechanics of of collaborating with a writer I'd be interested in because I know Sean got something back from from Jason that, that, that who they work with and he said well I just put it back into Scrivener because I guess he uses something else. I'm just wondering how people work together. Um, you mean just with technology, or just um, working. That's my add-on. I don't know what. Yeah, are we asking means. about collaborative tools? Well, I I was specifically asking what she used for outlining, uh, not necessarily collaborating, but. So it's funny. So I'm actually kind. Of, you know, I'm this out of the box. I like to work with with writers and help them discover their own unique process. But I'm actually kind of a. a um, I like doing the traditional outlining method for me. It works well for me. Um, but a lot of people actually work well just drawing big boxes and writing things out and connecting them on paper. Some famous authors would make outlines on their walls and, you know, some people like to put them on note cards. There are some online tools and I have them in my book, but at the moment I cannot remember the web address. Um, I can also send that to you after this, after this podcast. Buy the book, but, folks. <laughs> um, but there are some actually that will allow you to manipulate your outline on on um, the computer screen, so you can kind of reorder things and you know move it around. So that's how Scrapple works, right, Dave? Yeah. Which uh, is the by literature and latte, the same people who do Scrivener. Oh, okay. 
So there you go. Dave, is that still in beta, or is that like... No, 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 that, that's available uh, from them and in the Apple App Store. I don't know if it's available for Windows or not yet. So I have another question, and maybe this, maybe this will be the one we wrap up on, is um, how much of this varies depending on the writer? Because we, I mean, every writer's process is different in terms of, you know, whether they pants or plot, and whether they outline visually, if they outline at all, and all this stuff, and how they write, and how many drafts. Um, as far as like writing, collaborating with a writer, how much of that is sort of individual writer dependent? Oh, it's, I mean, it, it's totally, completely individual. Everyone's different. A more experienced writer will know how to plan their book on their own and, you know, can do all of that stuff on their own. Um, and, yeah, it's just, it's so individual. The thing that's not individual is proofreading, I feel like. Mm -hmm. That's kind of pretty straight across the board. Everybody needs that to happen. Um, but yeah, every author I work with is different. Some need more hand-holding than others. Some really like to just kind of get my feedback and, and do it on their own. And um, yeah, it's just completely different. Everyone's different and unique. So you got to find the right person and find your own process. So I, I, I will mm -hmm. say we, ha we have some discussion in the YouTube comments where uh, somebody was $400 for 30K was what everybody quoted... Uh, and it, it, it is, I, I know that a lot of people do charge less, but that doesn't mean you should use them. Uh, right. <laughs> well, you end up is. spending more, too, I think, because you have to get it redone. So not only did you pay the yeah. low fee, but then you have to go pay more anyway yeah. because it was a horrible edit. So. It's like, editing is like um, getting work done on your car, right? Like you can get really cheap work done, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have to get more, even more expensive work done two months Or it'll later. cause more, well, more Chr damage. Chr Chr Chrissy's saying that Garrett, Garrett charges that, I guess, uh, for, for some of his people. And, and that's fine that Garrett's doing that, but Garrett is not and uh, uh, he's not a professional editor. He he might help you with your work, and he might do uh, you know a better job than a lot of other people that you you don't know and stuff. But he's not a professional editor. There is a distinction between a professional editor and somebody you know that's willing to do the work. And mm -hmm. we've used people that we know willing to do the work, and you know sometimes it's worked well, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so you know, to, to all the people that are watching, if if you have somebody that you think is doing a good job, and your book sales are fine, your readers are happy. If that's what works, stick with it. You know, but most people, I think, do need somebody on a more professional level, somebody that's been trained in editing, somebody that really knows what to look for. And you know, hats off to you, Stacy. I, I think uh, I think editing is uh, it's something. It, 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 I think for us, for writers, it's kind of like going to a mechanic. You don't know how bad you're getting screwed or how much it's going to cost. <laughs> so you're like kind of nervous because you're, you're trusting your car with somebody and we're trusting mm -hmm. our book with somebody. And, and, and that's why I think what Stacy said is very important. Get, in, get to know. Get to know the person you're working with. Get to know your mechanic. Get to know your editor. This person is going to help you and help your, your book do a lot better than it would on its own. Yeah, editors so. make good writers great, and you know, great writers like amazing, and you you, you need that. Um, I also really really like Stacy that you were talking about how important like pre-editing is, and I mean we talk a lot about that as far as writing speed and writing well. That you don't come to the blank page; you have some idea before you start writing for that day, because if you do, you'll write more, and it will likely be much better than mm -hmm. struggling through like marginal copy, which is the worst thing you can do as a writer, right? Absolutely. Um, so I love that you're saying some of the editing, some of the most important editing actually takes place before you even write. That's that's smart. Okay, uh, one last question. If, if, <laughs> if, 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 if a writer was going to scrimp anywhere, would, would you... Would That's you do question. it? Would you do it on the developmental area, or would you do it on the proofreading area? Let, let's say, let's say you, you're. Oh, you're okay. gonna make me answer that question. Yes, really? I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I think I personally, I think you know, if you have a group of beta readers, or you already have an audience, and you kind of know what your audience likes, and your reader, your beta readers, you know, give you good input, the, the maybe developmental editing, editing is not necessarily a cost you have. To to endure if you have a crew of people that can help you. I would have Whereas, gone the other way, Dave, because okay. ty anybody can catch typos. Yeah. I mean, well, that's exactly... I, I don't know. Yeah, but how, confident, <laughs> yeah. how confident are you of your story? I think that depends on the writer and the project. Because yeah. Well, let like, Stacy answer. 
<laughs> no. Well, uh, well, I so actually, I would say that you know proofreading is really important. I recommend that people have three proofreads done on their book. But if you have a low budget, I would say you need you know you need to have at least one. Um, three proofreads by the same editor or different? No, I would definitely use different editors for that. I mean, okay. just physically, the human eye can't catch errors after they've looked at something long, you know, for too long. But, but Which is why I've been married so long. <laughs> my wife doesn't catch my errors. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so, no, I actually would agree that... <laughs> that was the line of the The day. developmental and content editing is really important because as an author, you are unable to objectively approach your story. I mean, you just can't. So getting a professional outside opinion that can put on the reader hat and look at your book through a reader's perspective is the most important thing that you can do for your book. Do you think that that matters less if you have if you have more than one person writing? So if you're collaborating, you already have kind of a volley there. You have a partner to say, well, that doesn't really work, but this does. And does that make it less important? I would still eyes? say, you know, a cursory read of it. So you can hire somebody to do kind of a lesser edit where they're not going as in-depth, but they, they do basically offer intellectual feedback as they read it, and they'll just kind of, you know, see certain sections, ask questions. So I would still recommend hiring somebody to read it and offer feedback, but it could be less in-depth than, say, a content edit would be where they're closely looking at every single thing in your book. Okay, what 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 specifically do you specialize in uh, editing wise, Stacy? If um, any of our listeners are <laughs> interested in hiring you, sure. I'm a so I'm a writing coach, ghostwriter, and I work with developmental and content editing. Those are my areas of expertise. So, Stacy, your website is Stacy N S E N N I S dot com. Are there any other places? And the editor's eye is is your book. Are there any other? Things people should know about, things you're doing, places to connect with you, any of that? Sure. Um, so my publisher's website is nightowlspress.com, and they have a, a full kind of part of their site devoted to the editor's eye, and it also has some of the, the download I mentioned earlier, the reader feedback form, and then I think it has three additional um, PDFs that you can download that are actually offered in the editor's eye, but we decided to put them up for free download on nightallspress.com and on my site. Um, so, you know, there's that. And I have a blog that I keep that lately has been kind of devoted to my six-month-old and creativity and that sort of thing. But I often blog about um, writing and editing and, and thoughts and tips for authors. And I tweet stuff on, you know, at Stacey Ennis on Twitter, my Twitter handle. Um, so, yeah. And uh, what, what kind of fiction do you write? Or are you writing? Um, you know, I don't write fiction. I, I write creative okay. nonfiction. Okay. Yeah, but I tend um, my ghostwriting is all is strictly nonfiction right now. Editor eye is what I um, what I say I have when I'm trying to talk my wife into an afternoon nap. I'm not. Even <laughs> I say, baby, I got editor eye. Let's lay down. I don't even understand what that means. <laughs> I don't even. It's right over wow. Here. Sean should write more comedy. <laughs> yeah, you really, you really should. <laughs> the beloved author space shuttle. All right, so um, Stacy, it's been great having you on. Uh, I'll just remind everybody the short link I made was selfpublishingpodcast.com slash edit for the editor's eye, stacyennis.com, and uh, just, just thanks so much for being on. It's, it's been fantastic. Thank yeah, you. thank you so thank much you, for Stacey. having me. All right, so this has been the Self Publishing Podcast. If you have any questions or anything, selfpublishingpodcast.com, and um, as usual, you can engage in, in the comments section uh, for this episode and I don't know. I haven't done a call for that for a while, so why not? <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you on the next show. <laughs>